Dr. Margot Cushel. Oh, Dr. Margot Cushel. She's a professor of medicine and division chief of the Division of Vulnerable Populations at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and the director of the UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations and UCSF Minneapolis Homelessness and Housing Initiative. She is a practicing internist at San Francisco General, and her research focuses on the causes and consequences of homelessness and housing instability with the goal of preventing and ending homelessness and ameliorating the effects of homelessness and housing instability on health. So we're really grateful to have her here to speak with us today. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Cushell. We really appreciate it. And we're looking forward to hearing about homelessness, what healthcare providers need to know. And again, we could all turn on our videos so she's not speaking to a bunch of uh, blank boxes. That would be great. Thank you so much. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. Let me just try to get the hardest thing of these presentations going to get the right display. Um, so um, I'm Margot Cushell, and I'm going to start with um, sort of a 20,000 foot view just to frame the issue, which um, as we were sort of chatting before, I'm sure You've noticed if you drive around San Francisco in all of the hospitals, no longer just a general, just to try to explain a little bit of how we got here. And then I'm gonna, um, we'll get a little more pragmatic at the end of what things can do. And I've left time for Q and A. So this is a number you might see floating around. It's a problematic number. It's likely an undercount and it's a point in time estimate. Are you, um... Are you trying to share your screen? Yeah, is it not sharing? No, I can't see it. Okay, let me see what is, sorry about that. There we go. How is that? All right, yes, very good. Perfect, perfect. Sorry about that, it's early for me. So <laughs> anyway, this um, number 580,466 is um, from a few years ago, the estimate of the number of uh, Americans experiencing homelessness on a given night. The number of people experiencing it over the course of the year is probably about three times as high as that um, as that number, but it gives you a sense of the scale of the problem. Um, you have probably heard a ton of chatter about homelessness and you might have ideas about it. I'm just gonna start and hopefully in this talk we'll debunk some myths, but this is just a few um, of the key myths that we um, that that we know about, one is people often talk about homelessness as if it were caused by mental health or substance use problems. Um, the fact is, and I will try to convince you of this, homelessness is full on caused by the lack of affordable housing, and all of the solutions run through fixing that problem. There's a huge myth that people sort of flock to San Francisco, to California. And I could say like, particularly pre-pandemic, I would give talks all over the country and it is actually hilarious because no matter where you go, everybody is convinced that they are the epicenter and everyone's flocking there. But there's a lot of myths that people come here because of our weather, because of our services, um, because of drugs, because of, you know, who knows what. But actually, interestingly, a similar or probably a higher proportion of people who are homeless are from the community in which they're from. There is truth that people do move, but the movement is not in any particular direction. So it's a little bit random. And that, um, and that people do tend to move from sub suburbs if they lose their housing there into central cities, but there isn't this sort of mass sucking sound into San Francisco. And then um, probably the most abiding myth, and this is really resurfaced, um, even though there's now decades of evidence that this would be the wrong way to go, is that people need treatment for their mental health and substance use problems before they can be housed. And that is actually um, not true. It's actually, as someone who does a lot of mental health and substance use treatment, it's actually incredibly difficult to treat people while they're homeless. And we have really, really good evidence that if you start with the housing, not only does the treatment go better, but we absolutely can keep people housed. Um, so why are people homeless? I think it's important to distinguish sort of two variations of that question. I think there are really two questions embedded in there that are actually have slightly different answers. The first question is, why are there so many people in X region that are homeless? Why are there so many people in the US that are homeless? But more specifically, why are there so many people in San Francisco, LA, 
et cetera, that are homeless. And then the next question is what I think people think they're answering is why is this particular person homeless? And that's where you can get the variety of answers. So this is a framework um, that was sort of put out in the early 1990s um, by Marty Burt and colleagues that talks about homelessness at its base as an interaction between structural factors. So affordable housing, stagnated wages, income inequality, structural racism, um, and individual vulnerabilities. So things like mental health disabilities, substance use disorders, adverse childhood. And then the presence or the absence of a safety net. Do we have unemployment insurance? Do we have subsidized housing? Those types of things. And what they noted back then is that the less favorable the structural factors are and the availability of the safety net, the fewer individual vulnerabilities you need to become homeless. So if you travel or work or are in, let's say, Northern Europe, which has a very strong um, safety net, really flat income, lots and lots of subsidized housing, you will still see some people who are homeless, but there, the people you see who are homeless will be people with really, really marked individual vulnerabilities, you know, very poorly controlled mental health problems, et cetera. In 2022, in the United States, you definitely do not need those problems to become homeless. And most people, where the majority of people experiencing homelessness are, do not actually even have those problems. Um, this is a relatively recent book that if you're interested in this topic, it's a quick read and it's great, which has the name Homelessness as a Housing Problem and uh, by Aldern and Coburn. And they they sort of posit these, this framework of that, that they're drivers of homelessness, which are the systemic factors that create overall homelessness rates and the difference between communities lack of affordable housing, income inequality, structural racism. And they distinguish that from what they call the precipitants, which I think we as healthcare providers might use a different term, but get the gist, which are the individual risk factors that increase the chance that any person in a community becomes the person who's homeless. And with this, substance use disorders and mental health problems absolutely are big problems. When they talked to me before writing this book, I told them this analogy. They later told me that like, just about everyone they spoke to told them this analogy. And I think that they did a really good job describing it. And they basically said, think about homelessness like a game of musical chairs. If your kids ever played it at a birthday party, you know, you've got 10 chairs, 10 kids, play the music. And then a parent pulls away the chair and you stop the music and the kids scramble for the remaining chairs. And they know that if a kid at the party the night before sprained their ankle, was on crutches, didn't really know how to use crutches, you stop the music, that kid is the most likely to be without a chair. But, but the real reason, so if you ask the question, why is this kid standing? Well, this kid is standing because they're clumsy and they're on crutches and they sprained their ankle. But if you ask the reason, why is there someone standing? There's someone standing because there are only nine chairs. And had there been 10 chairs, that kid eventually would have found their way to the chair. And had that kid not been there and everyone been like an elite athlete and you have nine chairs, either two people are gonna be sitting on top of each other or you're gonna have someone standing. And so that's how I think about homelessness. The fundamental problem is we don't have enough chairs. But it's not surprising in sort of a brutal market for housing that the people who are most likely to lose out are those with these sort of stigmatized disorders that make it really difficult to function, earn wages, those kind of things. So if you ask why California is such a mess, this is actually your answer. We are actually the second worst state in the nation on this metric. Nevada actually beats us out. Um, so in the country right now, there are only 36 units of housing for every 100 extremely low-income households. That's about the affordable and available. So let me break that down for you. An extremely low-income household is any household that makes less than 30% of the area median income. And that's decided by these like relatively small geographic areas. So the area median income in San Francisco is much, much higher than like it's at, say, a small town in Mississippi, but anyone who makes less than 30% of the median income of their area counts as extremely low income. Affordable and available means that the family or the household can pay for it, paying 30% of their income or less. The fact that those numbers are both 30% are coincidence. But if you're very poor and you spend more than 30% of your household income on rent, 
you don't have money left for food, for healthcare, for transportation, and you're at very high risk of sort of falling behind in rent and becoming homeless. And then available just means that it exists, it's habitable, and it's actually not occupied by someone who earns more money. Um, so nationwide, only 36 units for every 100 households. In California, we have 23 units available and affordable for every 100 extremely low-income households, which puts us at a deficit of a million units. There are an estimated about 170,000 people experiencing homelessness per night. In, um, in California, we are a million units short. Most units hold more than one person. So the only reason that we only have 170,000 people is a lot of people are just double, tripled, quadrupled up. Um, we just have this massive structural deficit and no amount of funding towards homeless services, certainly no amount of mental health care or addiction care or anything like that is gonna get us out of this crisis until we fix it. It's, it was 21 a few years ago and it's creeping up very slowly. We probably don't need to get to 100, but we need to get to much closer to 100 than we are now if we're actually gonna make a dent. So there is some empiric evidence for this. If you chart out where homelessness is more common as you go towards the right side of the, of the graph, um, the median rent of a house, of a like a one bedroom apartment goes up. This is a, from 2017, so it's a bit outdated, but you get the idea. And as you go up, um, the homelessness rates in a community go up. You can see that the further you are to the right, the line is you can actually draw sort of a linear line through that. People have done research, like Zillow has done research that shows that every hundred dollars of median income goes up, the homelessness rates in the community go up um, significantly by about three, eight percent. And then if you chart out where homelessness is common versus where drug use is common, actually the regions in the country where drug use is most common, and we measure this by tracking surveys that we do by things like overdose rates and other, other sort of um, accepted formulas, substance use is much more common in the former Appalachia and the sort of industrial Midwest. So like the Ohio, West Virginia, that part of the country, the significantly higher rates of substance use than we have here in California. But we have about one eighth, this, you know, one fourth the substance use, much higher housing costs, and about eight times the homelessness rate. So the other part of this problem is that the federal government has sort of completely disinvested in paying for affordable housing. And just to be clear, I don't think that this is a problem that city or state governments can fix on their own. And it's just one measure of the disinvestment. One of the ways that very poor families um, afford housing is through subsidies. And right now, there are lots of problems with um, subsidies. You might have heard of the program Section 8, which is formerly called Housing Choice Vouchers, where a household um, gets a voucher, looks for housing on the free market, they pay 30% of their income and the federal government guarantees the rest. Lots of problems with these. They can be really hard to use in areas like California where homeowners or, or owners don't really want to rent to these households. Lots of bureaucracy, lots of people who need it don't qualify, lots and lots of problems. But fundamentally, only one um, in four households in the U.S. who meet the very strict requirements receive it. It's not an entitlement. There's a certain amount of money in the federal budget for it. And once they run out, they run out. So imagine if we ran Medicaid like this. If you qualified and you were in a state with Medicaid expansion, they said, ah, oh, sorry, thanks. Thanks for applying, but, um, but we don't have any Medicaid left. So you have to wait. Um, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, which is what the story is like for Housing Choice vouchers. In the Bay Area, the waiting lists open one or two days. They've been open for one or two days in the last 10 years, meaning you couldn't even get your name on a list for these in the last 10 years because the lists were so long that they stopped taking names. So, and then finally, I think it's impossible to have any talk about homelessness without sort of naming the elephant in the room, which is racism. And just a reminder that housing and housing inequality is one of the main ways that racism where sort of the rubber has hit the roads in the United States. In the US, home ownership has been the primary means of familial intergenerational wealth building. And until very recently, in our collective history, until the fair housing laws were passed in the late 1960s, it was completely legal to discriminate 
on, um, on things like home ownership, unethical, immoral, racist, but completely legal. There was this thing you've probably heard of, redlining, where, um, where until the fair housing laws were passed, there was legal discrimination in home ownership such that communities were what was called redlined, where basically black and brown households were not allowed to buy houses in certain communities. Owners had racial covenants, meaning if you lived in a certain community, you would have something saying you could not sell to someone who is black or brown, so black or brown households couldn't live in white ways of sort of urban areas and things. So they were forced into other areas. And then the federally backed mortgages got into the picture and basically said, if you don't live in one of these basically white restricted areas, we won't give you a mortgage. We, we think it's too risky. We won't grant mortgages to the places where black and brown households had to live. And, or if they granted them, they granted them at like extremely serious terms. This meant that in the post-World War II boom in American home ownership, Black and brown households were basically completely left out of that. This has been an illegal practice since the late 1960s, but we know, one, that these disinvested neighborhoods, the red line neighborhoods that Black and brown households sort of moved into, we still live in those segregated neighborhoods. You really can look and track um, racial variation by those old red lines partially because things got set there and partially because there is ongoing discrimination. Super well-documented discrimination in rental housing. So they do things like cheap secret shoppers. And it turns out if you have this same criteria, the same application, and you show up in your white family or you show up in your black family, if you're a black family, you're much less likely to get the rental housing. This means that even now, illegal, but it happens all the time, Black families wind up spending much more money to get the same quality housing. You saw this play out in the predatory lending crisis of 2008 and the foreclosure crisis where Black and brown households were targeted um, for these predatory loans, Black and brown households who were homeowners, so foreclosure rates were much, much higher. You put all those things together with well-documented discrimination in the criminal justice systems and employment systems and in educational systems, and just a reminder, that we fund our public education through local tax dollars as a large part of our of how we fund them. So the schools in these formerly sort of redlined areas um, are much have much less funding, and that plays into educational discrimination. It's perhaps not a surprise that Black Americans are three to fourfold overrepresented among people experiencing homelessness. In San Francisco, our statistics are much worse. Right now, fewer than um, 5% of San Franciscans identify as Black, and 37% of those experiencing homelessness do. So this is just a little bit of rates of homelessness by race or ethnicity. I will tell you in this year's counts, um, there is a huge increase in Latinx um, homelessness. So those numbers are going to start going up. But you can see that Pacific Islander, Black, Native Americans are dramatically overrepresented in the homeless um, population. Um, so let's get a little bit to how this is sort of like <laughs> homelessness 101s really fast. I don't think it's a surprise to any of you that people who experience homelessness are a lot sicker. When we ask what we call the SF1, or this one question which tends to have a lot of prognostic um, indicators of whether someone's going to be hospitalized in the next year, whether you're going to die, how would you rate your health? Um, people experiencing homelessness, um, about 35 to 40% will say that their health is for fair or poor. This compares to about 10 or 11% of Americans in the general population. Um, and this is only, um, this disparity is only worsening. You can see that folks who are poor but not homeless fall somewhere in the middle. Um, yes, mental health and substance use problems are very prevalent. For the reasons that we spoke about, these vulnerabilities increase the risk that people become homeless, but also we know that once people become homeless, one, it's much harder to stop using or to sort of get treatment or engage in treatment, and two, the stresses, the victimization, the trauma of homelessness tends to lead people actually to use more. So lots and lots of sort of numbers all around, but it looks like about a third to two-thirds of um, people experiencing homeless have a lifetime history of, a, of an alcohol use disorder. Um, about, depending on the sample, 20 to 60% have a lifetime history of a substance use, non-alcohol substance use disorder. Um, and that there's a high prevalence 
of serious mental illness compared to the general population. Although the most common mental health problem experienced by people um, experiencing homelessness is depression, where about 38 to 40 percent of people have significant depression in sort of multiple studies, and post traumatic stress disorder, where about a third meet criteria for PTSD. We think there's this bi directional relationship between homelessness and substance use. Yes, people are at higher risk of becoming homeless, but once you're homeless, these things all get worse. Um, just had to throw this in, um, a, a medical student, um, Clay Carter, working with Colleen Sabatini and working on data that we have from an ongoing study of older homeless adults, looked at the prevalence of um, fractures, lifetime pregnant prevalence. We also have some incidence fractures and arthritis and things. So 44% of our sample reported being diagnosed with arthritis, which is interesting because these folks are 50 and older, median age 57. And they have very poor access to healthcare. So getting diagnosed with anything is sort of, uh, it's gonna be an understatement. A half told us that they had had a fracture in their lifetime. But um, what was, I thought most interesting is using a standardized question of like whether your fracture healed completely. A third said they had at least one fracture that had not healed completely. The most common causes of these fractures were interpersonal violence. So people being assaulted um, or others, motor vehicle accidents, and then standing falls. I can tell you that in every group that I work with experiencing um, homelessness, their number one and two complaints are their teeth and their bones. So um, this is the big problem that impacts their life, huge mobility problems, people's gates are awful, and they have lots of pain and discomfort and loss of function from this. So we know that homeless folks die much more likely than the general population. The causes of death and the proportional increase in death differ based on the age. So when you look at homeless populations in their early adulthood, we see mortality rates nine to 10 times that that we would expect. And the leading causes of death or drug overdose really stands out. And then there are things like substance use disorder, and HIV. There is some heart disease. The heart disease in that population tends to be related to um, drug and alcohol use. Once you get to populations that are 50 and older, which now make up about half of all single homeless adults, the leading causes of death are the same that they are in the general population, which is people are dying of cancer and they're dying of heart disease. Um, that said, drug overdoses come in generally about a third and are significantly higher than the baseline population. In this population, we see mortality rates three to five times what we would expect. Not surprised to any of you that there are very high rates of emergency department use, no matter how you look at it. Um, this is, if you um, look, you can see the total visits in the dark blue and that very big spike um, is, uh, is basically rates of ED visits by people experiencing homelessness. So the take home point here is if you're homeless, your rate of ED use is just dramatically higher than everybody else. Um, we see very low rates of non-emergency department ambulatory care. So very, very hard for um, folks who are homeless to, um, to receive care outside the ED. And then if you look within populations of people experiencing homelessness, you'll see, you know, um, about 50% into the ED in the past year across sort of all comers, but it's a very small group of people experiencing homelessness who cycle through repeatedly who account for the majority of the use. So about 7% of those experiencing homelessness account for about half the ED use of the whole population. Um, we see much more frequent um, hospital stays, and longer hospital stays. And speaking as an as an internist, you know, we see more hospital stays for a couple of reasons. People are sicker. So from your perspective, a lot more trauma, right? There's much less elective surgery, but much more trauma. From our perspective, people have these pre-existing health conditions that are poorly controlled, um, use of substances, so they're sicker. 
The second thing is that small problems become big, right? Things that we could treat easily in primary care don't get treated. So people get admitted for asthma exacerbations, for poorly controlled diabetes, for infections that we could have caught early that don't get caught. And then probably more importantly, we lower our admission thresholds. There's so little that we can do outpatient. So there are a ton of things that in internal medicine, we would never admit a house person for that we just have to admit people to the hospital because we have no other choice. Once they're in the hospital, much more difficult to discharge so that when you look at DRG sort of um, uh, controlled uh, reasons for hospitalizations, hospital stays are about 33% longer. Um, they're also much, much, much more likely to be readmitted. And these numbers are for all causes, but we see similar numbers for post-surgical admissions, where um, some of this work is done in Canada, where they have really good data, both on who's homeless, but they also know exactly who's come to the hospital or not, where 30-day readmissions are about eightfold um, higher than you would expect. And, um, and that's in a place where universal healthcare, right? The issue is not that people don't have health insurance, it's that they just can't really manage um, accessing care and things. So what in the world do we do? So let's just start structurally as I um, hopefully have made the point every conversation about this, we need to like, you know, look away from the shiny object of mental health and substance use, and we need to fix a structural deficit. We, I can promise you there is nothing we're going to do that's going to fix this problem until we fix this um, deficit. These are the statistics in California with a one, um, there are about 1.3 million extremely low income rental households and a million units um, short of housing. Um, we need to do many things to do that. Mostly it needs to come from the federal government. We need more support to, to build this housing. There are a bunch of mechanisms the federal government has to spur the development of extremely low-income housing, super underfunded. We need to get this number of only a third who qualify for subsidies getting them. We need to get that much closer to whole. And that will have two impacts. Not only will it help the households, but it will help us develop more housing because we often can get one-time funding to develop housing, but housing deteriorates and you need ongoing subsidies. And if people are only paying two or $300 in rent, they can't, you can't keep the housing up. And so that housing deteriorates and we lose it. So having more subsidies will help. At the state level, things need to be streamlined. They can throw a bunch of money in, particularly to housing construction. And at the local level, we need to fix zoning. In California, we're in such a disaster with our housing in large part, well, for many reasons, but one of the large reasons is that California is the hardest country in the state, the hardest state in the country to build housing. And that is mostly controlled at the local level. The state of California has recently got involved and Newsom has taken some really hard line um, sort of positions where he's basically said to local governments, if you don't fix this problem on your own, we're gonna pull state funding. And that is having a little bit of help, but this is where the battle lines are drawn from the local levels. What do we do? How do we actually house people? You may have heard this term before. It is um, enshrined in federal law. I will tell you that radical lefty George W. Bush was the president who actually brought housing first, and I give him full credit to um, the country, it got enshrined in federal law under um, Obama that, um, uh, that, um, that if you're gonna have any um, federal money for homelessness, you need to use it on a housing first philosophy, but it was actually GW Bush's administration who read the data, recognized the data and actually started integrating it. Housing First is not a specific program, it's really a philosophy. It says that you start with the housing and then you do everything else. Housing First does not mean that people don't need assistance when they're in housing. Many folks, particularly those with behavioral health disabilities need assistance, need supports, case management, mental health care, substance use treatment to have them thrive. But what we've learned empirically is if you force people to do that as a condition of housing, they won't do it and then they'll still be homeless. Whereas if you give them housing and you make those supports available, but you make it for the taking as opposed to mandatory, people use them and then they stay housed. Um, 
for those, you can say, well, gosh, I've seen, you know, patients, they're using meth every day, they have psychosis, surely you can't just house them, you actually can. Um, this is the program model that works best. It's called permanent supportive housing. And what it is, is subsidized housing. In San Francisco, we tend to do it by buildings. So there are whole buildings that are permanent supportive housing. In most of the country, this is what's called scattered site, where a program like a nonprofit that runs this will get a bunch of apartments throughout the city and put people in it. So it's kind of a San Francisco thing to do it only in these big buildings. There are sort of two different models, but all it is is subsidized housing. So people pay 30% of their income for the housing. Ever the government, the program pays the rest with either on-site or closely available supportive services. Um, there are really clear models of how many services people need, depending on how sick they are. We do a terrible job with that. We are under sort of developing the services, which make these not work very well. But we know that you can take, and we in fact did a big study of this in Santa Clara, where we took, we basically, the government of Santa Clara asked us to find their 400 sort of most impossible people, which we did using big data. And, you know, these were folks who had like, you know, 12 ED visits, five psych ED visits, four hospitalizations, 15 jail stays in the past year, like that kind of person. We basically didn't even go looking for them. We just used computers to put flags in all of their charts. So if the police picked them up, if they came to the ED, something popped up and said, call us. And then they gave us about 128 units of housing. So we actually wound up randomizing people on the spot. We would meet people at the jail steps at seven in the morning after they had been picked up for drunkenness all night. So we weren't like finding people at their best. We would meet them in the ED after they had been there. You know, as soon as the ED said they were good to go, we would start talking to them. We offered them a 50-50 chance of getting housing. We approached about um, almost 400 people and two people said no. Um, basically, everyone said yes for a 50-50 chance of getting housing after they had generally been up all night. Um, once they did, at the moment, we basically flipped a coin. And if they got randomized into housing, they were assigned a team of people, a case manager with sort of a sort of a social worker, a college educated person, and a peer. That group of three had 45 of these clients. So it was like a one to 15 ratio, but the social worker had 45 clients, basically. Um, we showed after seven years that 91% of the people who got randomized into housing got housed. And once they got housed, they stayed housed for um, over 90% of the nights over the next seven years. Really durable. So these were like the most disastrous people who you probably can recognize by name, the similar ones in San Francisco. We can do this. We just don't have the housing. Um, so um, there's a lot of talk now about homelessness prevention, about trying to predict who's likely to become homeless and try to get them resources to keep them. This is shown to be very cost effective only because homelessness is so expensive. The hard part is targeting people, but we're gonna see more and more use of looking at um, identifying people in the health system who meet certain indicators and then throwing some resources at them to try to keep them housed. There are some ongoing programs right now in California, including one that's now statewide with adult protective services, where if someone, if you ever refer someone to adult protective services because of abuse or neglect or self-neglect, um, the APS now has the ability to assess their housing and to do homelessness prevention. They can pay back rent, they can work on hoarding, they can get them legal services and the like um, in order to try to prevent the inflow into homelessness. Obviously, at the end of the day, we can't really do this without fixing the deeply affordable housing problems. We've got to stop the inflow into homelessness for every homeless person that we house in San Francisco, there are two more who become homeless. So we're just, you know, keep falling behind. Um, um, so now I'm gonna just get a little more pragmatic, just to say like, what can you actually do in clinic? So how do we allocate homeless services? Everything from shelter resources, but more importantly, um, housing services by federal mandate, um, systems have to use something called coordinated entry. So you might hear this, you might hear people talk about this, the one system in San Francisco or coordinated entry. Um, so San Francisco 
basically has to interview anyone who's either at risk of homelessness or homelessness. They have a um, algorithm that they use and that algorithm prioritizes them for services. Until the Prop C money, which is a big you know, amount of money in San Francisco for homelessness came, just to give you a sense of it, you needed to have been homeless for 14 years and have many mental health and substance use problems to get allocated for one of those units of housing. That's how short we were. It's gotten a little better now, but not a lot better. But there are new services flowing in. So it's important that people get signed up for this system. And um, your social work colleagues, if you identify someone who's homeless or um, at risk of homelessness, can help you. We're trying to get all people into the system so that if we have resources for them, they can get them. Because if you're not in the system, you can't get them. Um, I think it's really important for you to understand the myriad ways that homelessness impacts health. And what I always say is if something isn't adding up for your patient, you start to wonder. You know, for me, I'll have patients I've taken care of for years whose A1C has been perfectly controlled, blood pressure is perfectly controlled, and they walk into clinic and everything is like out of control. I ask them and inevitably it's because they've lost their housing. So think of it if someone is not adhering to treatment, if they're missing visits and the like. It's extraordinarily widespread. We tend to recognize it in the folks with lots of sort of mental health and substance use problems, but miss it in the Uber drivers, the construction workers, the dishwashers, you know, who are living in their cars or outside. So how do you screen or ask? I would avoid asking, are you homeless? Because it is so stigmatized and, and people are so ashamed to admit it that you'll get no's when people actually are homeless. What I do is I just normalize it. I say to my patients, you know, housing is in San Francisco is so expensive. How so many of my patients are struggling with it. How's it going for you? Um, there is actually in Epic a social risk factor section where this is recorded. So you can look and see many, like in primary care, we try, I'm trying to get everybody to ask these questions. So you might see it filled out already. Um, there are a couple standard screening tools. This is the one that they chose at the general um, is to ask people, what is your housing situation today? Um, I have housing, I do not have housing, or I choose to answer this question. And if someone says they have housing, we ask them, are you worried about losing your housing? And if they say yes, I'm referring them right away to legal services, to homelessness prevention, to anything I can to try to keep them there. Um, it's important to know your community resources. I don't expect orthopedists to like know every single you know, community resource, but just know that there are some community resources and know that you can refer people to them. Um, coordinated entry is really important. We have pretty good eviction defense in um, in San Francisco, so if people, and in Alameda for that matter, if people are at risk of losing their housing, we can get them a lawyer who can then help defend that housing, and that has been shown to be extremely um, useful. And then social work services in general, anyone who's homeless or at risk of homelessness should be meeting with your social workers. And then the other play is not to overpromise. You know, like the chances are they can't even get a shelter bed, forget about getting housing. So we don't wanna like lose trust and, you know, but I think it's important to say there are more services coming online. We have a lot of new funding coming in for this. Like let's at least explore what you might be eligible for. Obviously understand the structural factors that create and sustain homelessness and join me in advocating for the real solutions and talking to your family and friends. No, Trust me, this isn't all about mental health and substance use. So some key resources, refer to social workers and ask your social workers to refer to coordinated entry. If they have any questions about that, they can contact me. I can tell them it's all available on the web. They're doing a lot virtually now because of the pandemic. Um, medical respite, 100 bed specialized shelter that basically is for people um, recuperating from a hospitalization who otherwise could be discharged, but can't be discharged because of it. They will actually take people pre-hospitalization um, or who are not hospitalized in certain circumstances. You have to do a little bit of work around. This is just on e-referral. Um, I say, if you admit someone, you think they're gonna need it, refer them on the first day that they're in um, the hospital because there's a couple day wait to even be considered for it and advocate for it. 
Most shelters in San Francisco have shelter health care, meaning that they now have sort of nurses and some nurse practitioners and physicians dispersed throughout the shelters who can help you out. So if you're discharging someone on an oxyparin, let's say, and you can't get them into respite, it's worth connecting with shelter health because they can help ensure that the patient, they can store meds, help them get their meds and things like that. The other thing that I think is particularly important for orthopedists to know is most shelters kick people out during the day. So if you have someone who needs rest, you can write that request for them and advocate that they be allowed to stay in the shelter and shelter health will move them to a place where they can stay all day. If you are taking care of a patient with substance use disorder, I encourage you to call your colleagues in addiction medicine. They can really help you navigate through it. You are not on your own. They can work wonders. It will make your life easier. It will make your patient's life better. If you're prescribing opioids to anybody, but certainly to someone experiencing homelessness, or if you recognize that a patient uses any substances, please prescribe naloxone for them to carry with them. We're seeing a lot of the fentanyl overdoses are in people not expecting to be using opioids, but they're using other substances that are now contaminated. So it's just, we just are trying to flood naloxone everywhere we can get it. Um, and um, make sure before you discharge your patient that your patient actually can get the meds you're prescribing because half the time these patients can't. So see if your hospital pharmacist can get your patient to like walk out the door with their meds. And whenever you can simplify regimens. Um, push back against the individual narrative. I feel very comfortable treating substance use disorders and mental health. That is not the problem. We're not scared of those. We can do it. Use your voice to advocate for real solutions so we can all get out of this mess. Um, you know, homelessness right now, it's no surprise. Recent crisis proportion, mental health and substance use disorders are common. The underlying causes are structural. The population is aging, which we really get to. Healthcare system use can be chaotic. Efforts to release, reduce homelessness have worked. It's just that we can't stop the inflow into homelessness because of these structural things. And join me in saying my tagline, which is that there is no medicine as powerful as housing. All right, and then I stop the share so I can see folks and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, that was fabulous. Um, my first question is, can we get a copy of your presentation? Um, Because there is so much great information. Absolutely, I'll, um, I can send it to Rosie to, you or to whomever, yeah. Um, and then I, I did have a question um, about the study that you and Colleen are, are doing yeah. on musculoskeletal injuries and the high rate of non-unions. And this is actually something that I'd been thinking about when I was a resident rotating through San Francisco General. Yeah. And I was wondering what role we as orthopedic surgeons have in some of those negative outcomes with our own biases. Because I, I think about, yeah. you know, um, a homeless patient comes in with an ankle fracture. Yeah. It could be treated with surgery, could yeah. maybe be treated with a cast. Yeah. And are we biased being yeah. and worrying about that person being at a higher risk of an infection and then maybe leading that patient down a non-operative pathway to avoid a surgical complication, but then it leads to a non -union. This is just something I've always wondered. And do you have data on that or ideas on how to measure that? Yeah, I mean, it's a really great question. And I'm actually just working with one of the general surgery NCSP scholars, um, looking at this question in general surgery of how much of this is sort of surgical decision making between people not, you know, late presentations or not presenting. And my guess is it's probably a little bit of everything, right? That people are not presenting. We see lots of folks, the rate of um, people getting hit by cars is astonishing and sort of under talked about. If you look at um, PEDS versus motor vehicle deaths in San Francisco, folks experiencing homelessness are about nine times overrepresented. And partially this is that people are just out all day. Like I'm not going to get hit by a car when I'm sitting in my house, right? But it's also people have decreased sensorium and all of those things. People walk really slowly, so they're getting hit in crosswalks. And so one of it is they're just getting injured and they're not always presenting for care. They, you know, there's so much stigma. They've been treated this population has been treated so badly by the healthcare system in general that they don't want to go in. So we have seems like my team calls me all the time with this on study where they're like, so-and-so just came in. They're like, their arm is like falling off or they have like 
this huge, you know, my team is non-medical, but they're, you know, they're like research assistants and they're like, this looks really bad and I can't talk them into going in for care. Can I, you know, can you talk them in? And, and they'll send me a picture and the person will have like a clear fracture or like an ulcer and they just won't, won't go in for care. So part of it is that they're not presenting, but we probably play a role in that in stigma. Um, part of it is this sort of the same thing that causes the readmission that they, you might do something and then they don't follow up. I mean, I can tell you how many of my primary care patients, you know, where they'll have a traumatic injury and then they just never show up again. Even if testing was exactly the right thing to do, they still needed adjustments and follow up and they just don't get it. And some of it is, yeah, they're probably not being offered surgery. Now there is a higher risk of infection. Like that is actually a true concern. So it's not just stigma, but it is sort of structures. Like you know, can we expand the use of things like respite to get people to a place where you would feel more comfortable doing, doing surgery? Can we get our addiction medicine colleagues involved to try to decrease the risk of um, substance use sort of causing all sorts of problems? So I would think it's probably a both end. People aren't presenting, which is partially because their lives are chaotic and partially because of stigma. They are not following up appropriately for both those reasons. And where probably there is probably a level of surgical decision-making, which is not necessarily like, it doesn't come out of nowhere, but the question is, can we work around it? And we're looking, so we're going to look at this question for general surgery outcomes to look at surgical decision-making. I would be super interested if someone wanted to start thinking about how we look about it with ortho decision-making. Sam. Hey, hi, Margo. This is mm -hmm. Sam Warshed. I, I, I attended the general yeah. um, uh, and have for a long time. And um, yeah, I think th this was Rosie was uh, alluding to a, a kind of a, a you know, a, a project that we thought about, but never kind of got off the ground. And I, I think there are really interesting questions to ask about what constitutes conservative management, yeah. right? I mean, we think operative, but I, I can tell you that at least from the orthopedic standpoint, I mean, we're a group that is very thoughtful about, yeah. you know, about appropriate care for our patients. Um, and we, we still grapple with this question of, you know, yeah. is the conservative thing to actually fix a fracture that we may actually manage non-operatively and, and others, I, we don't know, because we, we understand the, some of at least the, the life challenges that a lot of, a, a lot of our homeless patients have. Um, you know, I, I actually think, and I brought this, you know, mentality back from Harborview where we all, you know, where I trained for trauma and we had a, a similar yeah. uh, homeless population there. And, um, you know, it, we often thought, and I still do that, you know, our patients have access to actually remarkably uh, high quality trauma care. I mean, I'm yeah. myself accepted. Okay. The people around me are phenomenal. I'm, you know, I, I do okay. But um, and, and I, I do believe that. I mean, I see stuff that's done at, you know, fancy private hospitals yeah. that makes my jaw drop and, and, and our patients really do get very high quality care. And, and so I do think, you know, this is maybe to support your argument that really it is about the, it is about the, what, what they see in the world outside of the hospital yeah. that um, affects yeah. a lot of what happens to them from, you know, from infections to non-unions. Yeah. Um, it, it's a, it's, it's a hard space to be. Uh, yeah. and to recover. Um, anyway, and, that, those are no, my absolutely. thoughts. First of all, not, your yeah. care is absolutely amazing. And no, no question about that. And I, and I think it, like, it isn't like made up that you're worried about infections. Like there are much higher infection rates. And are you, if you put a pin in someone and it gets infected, you're not doing them any favors. Um, I think it's a really hard thing. And I think we as a healthcare system probably need to figure out, I mean, you know, short of solving the whole problem, having these interim measures where we can support someone through and also just figure out what, what is best practice, right? Is it like, a, you know, what is going to, what is going to heal faster? Um, you know, pain management becomes really complicated and people have such bad experiences from like forever back with pain management that they, you know, their decision-making about what they're willing to do. It's, it's a really complicated, um, question, but it has huge implications for people's long-term, um, long-term function. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And yeah. yeah, maybe we will find a way to collaborate on this because I, I, I do think it's to. very interesting. Um, maybe we'll bring Dr. Wustrak back out of the, 
you know, the bullpen to, <laughs> to work on it. <laughs> awesome. Other questions? I had a question about the. Uh, oh no, Lisa, go ahead, please. Yeah, I had a question about the Santa Clara study that you yeah. mentioned. I was just wondering um, if you had any data on the health outcomes of the people who stayed housed during that study. Yeah, so we um, what this we basically looked at um, service utilization. So unfortunately, we were not able to look at health as much as service utilization. And so what we saw is um, in the control group, because Santa Clara was at a time of sort of dramatically increasing PSH when the study started, about 30% of the control group got a similar intervention. And we found um, dramatic reductions based on randomization, so with like intention to treat, in those who got randomized to housing, um, whether they got it, you know, they had dramatically reduced use of the psychiatric ED, dramatically increased use of outpatient psychiatric care. There was a little bit of the needle moving around um, physical health hospitalizations where, where we didn't quite read significance, but you could start to see that it was like, look like a reduction um, if we, you know, if we had a little more data in inpatient hospitalizations, we did not see a difference in death. Um, the death rates were astonishingly high in both groups, even though we had um, made as an exclusion factor people who the healthcare providers, when referring, thought someone, you know, anyone who had, let's say, end stage cancer or anyone who was thought to have less than six months left to live was excluded. And we got them into a different program, um, but we still saw astonishing mortality rates. So the cynics are like, oh, this didn't help at all. Um, I would say one, at least they died known and not like out on the street. But mostly the problem is that we were, you know, we have so little of this resource that by the time we were targeting these folks, these folks, you know, if you've, one of the indications for getting into this was having three or more medical hospitalizations in the past year. If you have three or more medical hospitalizations in the past year, you're, you're in the end of your life, right? That's generally like something bad is going on. And so no dis dis differences in mortality, big movement in um, acute psychiatric care, like huge, and, um, and probably starting to see that we were moving the needle on inpatient all-cause medical hospitalizations, physical health hospitalizations, non-psychiatric care. Tamara, did you want, I saw you put something oh, yeah. in the chat. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that um, working in this area, uh, first of all, Dr. Kushal, that was a fantastic talk. I'm, I'm really grateful. I'm a scientist in the department yeah. and uh, leading the UCSF Musculoskeletal Center. Yeah. And one of the things that we uh, care deeply about uh, supporting is encouraging more research in this, in this space and musculoskeletal research. Uh, we just got some funding to support uh, student research on multi-UC collaborative projects oh, in the cool. musculoskeletal space. So even if there's one person in our yeah. community who's musculoskeletal yeah. and there's someone else at a different UC, for example, um, who is not, then we uh, could help fund a student to work on this project for a couple of years. So um, please let me know if that's Exciting. interesting. I would love to um, get this group involved on this topic. Uh, thanks. Yeah, that would be great. We have, you know, we are, um, we have a couple things. We have, um, right now we're just sort of in discussions with the city because things are moving, but we have this incredible database um, that links medical, homeless systems, um, jail health, all these things um, it's called. Um, so we put out a lot of um, studies on this, but it allows us to look at different problems, at least within San Francisco. And there's now a um, statewide sort of, it's not perfect, but statewide database of everyone who's homeless basically. And I'm in negotiations with the state. What I'm trying to do is link that to things like Medicaid data or hospital discharge data. So it, we have the potential to do projects like that. Um, so a lot of the UC's hospitals are supposed to record whether someone's homeless or not. It's not great, um, but it is data. But so there is definitely possibilities to look at sort of using big data to try to answer some of these questions. And we could model it. The other, the other place that has this data are VA systems. And so with, um, uh, with our general surgery colleagues, we're working some in our local San Francisco data and some with the VA data to look at this question of like, what part of it is like, are there different 
surgical decision making for um, patients experiencing homelessness because VA has great data on whether people are homeless or not. That is really exciting. And you know, my last question was a lot of the resources you mentioned, I assume are at San Francisco General. Do you know if those same resources and the same epic um, yeah. risk factor is that also at no, so I think, site. yeah, UCSF um, Health definitely has uh, the homelessness plugged in. I think they're, I think they might have chosen the other, their two main screening tools. It's very similar. I think they chose the other one, which I actually like better, but it's definitely in Epic at UCSF. Um, Maria Raven, who runs the um, ED, she's the vice chair of emergency um, medicine and, and runs the Parnassus site is a close colleague of mine. She is the one who works on all of this local data. She's super interested in sort of um, these issues and she's been really leading the charge at UC Health to have, um, to have people record people's housing status at least through the ED, so it is there. Um, and then she and um, Hamilton Zaria are the two people who work on this data set. They're both ED docs, so they're super interested in trauma and things and I, I'm sure they would be super excited to also um, they, they're a part of BHHI and I'm sure they would be excited also to brainstorm about projects on this because I think it's a super important topic. Well, thank you so much. I think we're out of time and, and yes. that was so fantastic. I, I think we all learned a lot. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so us. much for having me. Thank you all. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Really appreciate it.